Hello, and welcome back to another Believe to See bonus episode. As a reminder, the Anselm Society's big Imagination Redeem conference is coming up fast. It's happening September 24th and 25th at an actual castle here in Colorado Springs. If you don't have your tickets, I recommend getting them right away because they have been going fast. Uh, to celebrate the conference, we have been posting memorable talks from our past conferences. The one this week is Dr. Anthony Esselin's keynote address at the 2018 conference. Dr. Esselin is a truly fascinating individual. As you'll be able to tell from the talk, he is not afraid to lob rhetorical grenades at everything from what they're teaching kids in schools these days to contemporary poetry to the state of New Jersey. But Dr. Esselin is far more than these grenades. Um, he's both incredibly brilliant and one of the most well-read and cultured people you'll ever meet in your life. Seriously, Dr. Esselin has this rare ability to take pretty much any work from the classic literary canon and infuse it with meaning and insight that you've never even considered before. It's really dazzling stuff. So the name of this talk is Teaching People to Open Their Eyes, and I think y'all will love it. Uh, so without further ado, here is Dr. Anthony Esselin at Imagination Redeemed 2018. Thank you all. Thank you, Brian. That last crack about poetry actually having to make sense if it's anything like decent poetry. Your young people in schools are not taught that. Uh, they're taught, I, I guess, the poets... Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 why did you use that image, Mr. Poe? Oh, well, you know, I don't know. It just sort of flowed, you know. Um, does it make any sense grammatically? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's, not, uh, that's not poetry. Um, I'm going to begin here today with a little passage from a great poet whose name is unknown to most high school students and college students. His name is John Milton. And when I say unknown, I mean 90% of college freshmen will not even recognize the name. Okay. This comes from Paradise Lost. And um, you have to imagine, that Satan is in the newly created world. That world is the physical universe. And he's landed in Eden. And it's a miserable day for Satan. First, because he's, he's been in hell, and he's Satan. And, and the physical universe is beautiful, and Eden is exuberant and lush. And the fiend, says Milton, saw undelighted all delight. And then he comes upon the thing that makes him feel worst of all. He comes upon us, unfallen. Two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike, erect, with native honor, clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the glorious image of their maker shone, truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure, severe, and yet in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men, though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed. For contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet, attractive grace. It's a ravishing scene I could go on. Uh, Satan becomes a kind of voyeur here, watching them, listening to the conversation of two young, innocent, passionately loving lovers in the Garden of Eden. The interesting thing about it is something that, for our sake here today, is something that Milton has picked up both from scripture and from, even from the classical pagans who understood that there was something markedly different about human beings when you were comparing them to other living things. Other animals, for instance. Other animals go on the ground, they creep, the creeping things that creep on the face of the earth, the, the four-footed beasts, the fish, and so forth, even the birds do not do what human beings do because they were not made in the image of, and likeness of God. As God said on that great moment in the history of uh, the, the Jews when the sacred author penned these words, and God said, let us make man in our image 
after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them, and God said. Uh, God will repeat part of the blessing that he has already conferred upon the living creatures with an addition. God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and that's different, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We are made in the image and likeness of God, meaning not just that we are more intelligent than my dog Jasper, but that we do something that is symbolized by, made physically evident by the fact that we stand upright and we can look towards the stars. The word stars is the final word in each of the three sections of Dante's Divine Comedy, not because he believed that God was up in the sky. God was not up in the sky. The sky is just part of the physical universe. God is, as Bishop Min said this morning, as it were, outside this whole universe of four dimensions that we live in, uh, height, breadth, width, uh, height, depth, etc., and time, right? We are meant to look towards God, who is everywhere, and yet is captured in his fullness by nothing that we can comprehend. That has, I think, a profound implications for how we uh, tell our stories. And St. Augustine is the one who recognizes this. And St. Augustine may be credited with writing the first autobiography, but it isn't an autobiography at all. Uh, Augustine's Confessions is a book about what it means to dwell within a story whose author is God, a story that is filled with countless other stories about the action of God in the lives of mankind, of races of mankind, especially the chosen people, and of individual human beings. I could put it very succinctly, as I think he does, in one of the first sentences of the Confessions. For you have made us for yourself, famous line, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, right, until they rest in you. If that's true, right, if we are made in the image and likeness of God, and we believe this to be true, this is true, and therefore God has made us for him, and our hearts must necessarily be restless until they rest in him, then the stories that we tell will be radically deficient if they are cut off from that intimate dimension of our being. That is, if you try, as the pagans themselves did not try, but as we now try, if you try to tell a strictly secular story about mankind or about an individual human being, you are, you are talking about a creature that does not really exist. It's not a fantasy, because a fantasy might open you out towards truth and whatnot. It's a truncated creature. Um, you have decided to treat not mankind, but a truncated and reduced vision of mankind. And if that's what your kids are getting in the schools when they read literature, um, their imaginations are being truncated also. Uh, I will say to you, uh, maybe you can uh, take this as a line and run with it sometime, but it doesn't matter whether your child gets all of the great theology in the world there is out there to get. Whoever controls your child's imagination controls the child, and Satan will gladly concede to you all the theology classes and philosophy classes even, as wonderful and as good and as powerful as they can be. If he has the imagination, then he's got the person, okay? I so say your kids go off uh, after, uh, you know, you're, you've homeschooled your kids, and they go off to college, uh, they go off to secular college, and they then proceed to have their imaginations formed by the uh, movies they watch there and the teachers of literature that they have there 
and so on. And the politicians in various departments who tell them stories. And you wonder after a few years, what the heck has happened? Well, the territory of the imagination has been conquered. And those are the heights as far as human beings are concerned. But it's all phony because as a matter of fact, God has made us in his image and he's made us for him. So that if we try to tell stories that ignore that dimension of what it means to be human, we are effectively talking about things that are not real, okay? Now, I wanna illustrate this by talking about things that are real from an author that I suppose everybody here has some experience with. Maybe the single author who wrote before 1900 that I, I can actually depend on most people having some knowledge of, even if you live in Kansas or New Jersey, Lord forbid. Um, you, you know the state motto of New Jersey comes from Dante. A lot of Italians in New Jersey. Uh, it's la ogni speranza, voi contrate, which means abandon all hope, you who enter here. <laughs> which they put on the signs as you go on Route 80, east through Pennsylvania into New Jersey, across the Delaware River, Re welcome to New Jersey, the Garden State, abandon all hope, you who <laughs> enter here. Um, I always tell that. It's Charles Dickens, okay? Everybody knows A Christmas Carol. And I wonder whether people actually really do encounter the book. If you um, take a look at a secular rendering of A Christmas Carol, it's as if the transition to be made was from Ebenezer Scrooge to Santa Claus. And Santa Claus is a confidence man running a confidence scheme. If you're really good, if you're nice and not naughty, you'll get something out of it, something which is not persecution, crucifixion. It's a little red wagon that you wanted or a nice doll or, or something. Um, Dickens did not have that in mind when he entitled his work A Christmas Carol. He wasn't thinking about Santa Baby or um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Drunkard. Uh, he was thinking about, in fact, the single carol that he was thinking about was God rest you merry, gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. That's the one. And it's the carol that is sung by the little boy at the very beginning of A Christmas Carol when Scrooge, in his wicked passion, drives the kid from the door. Okay? A Christmas Carol. Now, I, I will immediately ask a simple question. And no secular person that I've had any interactions with has been able to answer this question for me. Okay, secular person, what do you sing about that brings your heart joy? Or that consoles you in the depths of grief, or that brings you close to the truth about all human life? What do you sing about? Where are the bunch of secular people who get together to sing their hearts out? They can't sing their hearts out because they've cut their hearts out. And they did that when they decided. They've done that. They're trying to do that. Sometimes it's an operation that doesn't really succeed and they end up at cross purposes with themselves. But they try to do that when they say, I will not serve. I am not made in the image and likeness of God. Okay. But this is a book about not only the possibility that human beings can sing in honor of God, but the necessity. They must sing in honor of God. If they don't sing a Christmas carol, they lose their humanity. Okay. And Scrooge is in very close danger of losing his complete humanity. That's why he gets visited by the specters, the ghost of Marley, and then the three ghosts of Christmas. Um, the book, I don't know how it could possibly be taught in our, in our public asylums, because I don't know how you understand it without the Gospels. When Fred the nephew shows up to welcome Scrooge to dinner the following day at his house, a poor house, He's, he doesn't make much money. He says, when Scrooge makes fun of Christmas, when he, when he as a modernist calls it humbug, okay? That's what that means. This is just garbage, this is nonsense, this is silly. Only silly people believe in Christmas. Fred says, even apart from the sacred origin of the day, and of him who makes this day what it is, if anything about it can be separated from that, and the implication is that it can't really be. Yet still I consider that Christmas is the one day in all of the year when people do remember, I'm paraphrasing here, when they remember that they belong together, 
that they are all together on the same journey to the grave, and they are not members of a separate species. Okay. I mean, there Dickens has placed simultaneously our vertical dimension, so to speak, and not, that's not up there, our orientation towards God right next to our fellowship with our, our neighbors, because Dickens knows what Jesus said. All the law and the prophets are summed up in. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second commandment is like unto the first, which is, it's the flip coin image of the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When Scrooge is visited by Jacob Marley on that night, right, he goes home, he eats his little bit of gruel. If he were a secular person now, he might go on Facebook and check. Maybe he goes on the financial pages of Yahoo and checks the Dow Jones averages and whatnot. How are bill collectors doing these days? He's visited by, by Jacob Marley, who died seven years to the day before this one. Not six, not 13, but seven. He's thinking about the biblical number. On this day, Christmas Eve, and Scrooge was the only mourner at Jacob Marley's funeral, but he didn't mourn very much. In fact, it was a good day for Scrooge because before he got home that day, he made a really good bargain buying a bad debt. That's what he does for a living. He buys bad debts, and then he puts the screws to the people who owe the debt. You owe $1,000. You're not paying the $1,000. He buys it from the person who is originally owed the money, right? You know how these things work. He buys it for $400, and then he screws as much money from you as he can get. He made a great bargain. Jacob, he says to him, you were always a good man of business. I don't know how the modern secular man can read this passage and not understand that it's aimed at his way of life, okay? Business says Jacob Marley. Mankind was my business. Charity, patience, forbearance, benevolence were my business. What I did for a living, paraphrasing again, all this stuff that I did, you know, with the economy, was but a drop in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Mankind was my business. That, you can take that as a touchstone for everything that Charles Dickens wrote, right there. Um, instead, if you think about it this, right? Dickens is writing in a day before mass marketing. I think about how, how appalled he would be by our holiday called Black Friday, on which human beings, otherwise sensible, crucify themselves in the honor of a god called Mammon. Black Friday? So anyway, mankind was my business. Now what Scrooge has to learn through a Christmas carol is something that's very difficult for human beings to get through their skulls. Very hard for all of us. The default position for uh, fallen human beings is to worship the biggest thing that's nearby. I have written in some article or other that the three biggest things that are nearby, the things that human beings naturally fall to, um, one of them is big because it represents a very powerful drive, the most powerful drive that human beings and their physical bodies experience. It's also somewhat of a mystery to them, and natural, it's natural in an unnatural way that would, would turn it into a kind of God. That thing is sex. The next thing is obviously big because it can oppress you, it can pinch you every day of your life. For instance, how many people celebrated a couple of weeks ago National Vivisection Day? You know what I mean? It's, a day comes around once every year where we celebrate the opening of our veins to give uh, plenty of blood to our masters in the federal government. Um, April 15th. It's the state. You worship the state. The God becomes embodied in the state, or the state becomes a kind of God. And the third thing is the closest thing to everybody. It's big because it's so close. It's right there. It's yourself. State, sex, self. The three-poisoned God of our time. 
And they all go together, too, in a very nice way in our contemporary society. They all go together. So the large state, the overpowering state, grants you yourself, who are your own little god, uh, sexual freedom so that you can pursue a hedonistic life without regard to your neighbors. Other kinds of liberty the state is much less consistent about recognizing. To get through to human beings that God is not like those things, that that is actually pretty petty by comparison with what God is. It's nothing by comparison with what God is. God has chosen, out of all the peoples in the world, an otherwise insignificant people, the ancient Jews. The ancient Jews. They give us mathematics. They did not. They, they build really great buildings, so they built a temple or two. They didn't build the Parthenon. Great at sculpting? No, not great at sculpting. Great at painting? No, not great at painting. We have some of their poetry and scripture outside of scripture. What do we have of their literature? Not too much. What we have is the revelation of God. That's what we have from them. He chooses them. He doesn't choose the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Romans, the Greeks. He chooses them. What you have to learn in one fashion or another is what the disciples had to learn. Even the disciples who spent so much time with Jesus found this difficult. But in a sense, it's at the heart of all truly human stories, even stories by the pagans themselves, though they didn't understand it. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, uh, uh, Lord, um, who's going to be uh, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because you remember the mother of James and John, the quintessential pushy mother, okay? <laughs> Women, you, you know these sorts, right? Uh, you, you've ever had a kid in ballet? <laughs> All right? Well, my daughter knows how, my daughter knew that move in three lessons, and then still, still doesn't get that. So the mother, uh, in a, a different telling of this sort of thing in the Gospels, goes up to Jesus and says, I want you to promise me, Lord, that my two boys will sit, one at your right and one at your left. So they're, they're arguing about this. They don't understand anything. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That there is the kernel of one of the two great stories of mankind that I'll talk about today. You might say it is the Christmas carol. It is the nativity. This is the incarnation of Christ. By the way, I should say nativity, but also the feast that happens exactly nine months before the nativity, because not on December 25th would we celebrate the incarnate word in its first instantiation. The word was made flesh nine months previously as soon as Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. And at that point, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the point. How about, just as an aside, how Christians can accept abortion is it's completely illogical because the word was made flesh then, right then. Okay. If you want a really powerful visual image of God's violent eruption into a world of ruins, a world of sin, you can use your computers or iPads or whatever they're called and look up Tintoretto Annunciation. You'll never forget it. Tintoretto Annunciation. And he took a little child and set him in their midst. That's what Scrooge has to learn. Does anybody know offhand whether that verse exactly as it is, verbatim, appears in A Christmas Carol? Dickens has been leading up to it. We know that Bob Cratchit has a little boy. He's, he's got a big family. He's got a little boy named Tim, fear of the Lord, Timotheus, honor of the Lord, fear of the Lord, tiny Tim. Tiny Tim wears an iron brace, and he has to rely on crutches. The first time we meet tiny Tim, Bob has taken him home, 
they've gone to church. And Tim has said that he likes to be at church because he likes people to see him because through him they might be reminded of him who made blind men see and lame beggars walk, says Bob, and can barely get out the words because the throat chokes up. That little boy is the means of Scrooge's salvation. We can look at it the other way around. Uh, if we are a secular people, we'll only understand that that boy needs money and Scrooge has got to unpack his wallet. If we understand the real story here, the true story, it's that Scrooge is in desperate need of the salvation that is provided by means of this little child. When Scrooge is led by the ghost of Christmas yet to come, it's one miserable scene after another, one rather impersonal and even horrific scene after another, till Scrooge finally begs the specter, please, 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 bring me to a scene of tenderness that is associated with a death. And he brings them to the Cratchit home. And there in a corner is the crutch and a stool. Bob is not there yet. The mother is working, dinner. And Peter Cratchit, the oldest of the boys, is reading to the other children. They're two little children. He's reading to the two little children. And this is what he reads. And he called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. That's what he reads. Dickens didn't need to say more. Or we can uh, recall the scene in Mark where Jesus actually, after giving the apostles what for, he embraces the child. Okay? He took a little child and set him in their midst. The people who read A Christmas Carol had their imaginations formed by scripture, even if they were not sometimes particularly good Christians. And they understood that the whole meaning of life is in play right here, right then. Because unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is one of the two great stories, the great templates for stories for mankind. And we note, and your secular teachers will not note this, because they, secular teachers right now, I mean, they barely, if you say to them prodigal son, they don't know what you're talking about. If you said to an English teacher, can you read a poem by John Milton, you might get some English teachers who don't know, recognize the name. But most of the English teachers you'll get in high schools will not be able to read a poem by John Milton. Too tough. Never read. It's gone. But we who have read the story, the story, will recognize then what's going on. When Scrooge wakes up that morning and he doesn't know what day it is because Marley's ghost had led him to suppose that he would see three ghosts on three successive nights, okay? But God in his infinite mercy is not bound by that creature time, which is just another one of his creatures, just another thing that he has made. When Scrooge gets up that morning, he says, I don't know what day it is. I don't know anything at all. I am quite a baby. I am quite a baby. Boom. The whole novel has been leading up to that moment when Scrooge will say, I am quite a baby. And he will, he will get dressed. He will order as a surprise a big turkey sent to the Cratchit household. He will go to church. He will meet the people who tried to get him to pledge some money for charity, and he will pledge a great deal. And then he will humble himself, become, as it were, a penitent child. We might think of the prodigal son who has been living in a very far country, because if you're Jewish and you're feeding pigs, you must be in a far country. He goes to his nephew Fred's house, hat in hand, and asks as a favor if he'll be let in to dinner. He has been born again. Now, that leads to the second story, or is consummated in the second great story of man, which is the story of Easter. I'll read to you 
a passage from the Gospel of Luke. Luke is the cheerfulest, I think, of the Gospel writers. Um, Luke is the Gospel for optimists. Mark is the Gospel for marsh wiggles. <laughs> and John is the Gospel for poets and mystics. Matthew may be the Gospel for uh, people of the world. So, uh, Luke, chapter 24. The women go to the tomb, and the men at the tomb say something to them. They're standing there in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Which is rather like what the men will say when Christ it doesn't go up, like beam me up, Scotty. He goes out as the bishop said this morning. Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's like, we men of Galilee, why are you looking up there? <laughs> he's not here. He will come again. But they say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they said, oh, yeah. And they remembered his words. So the words didn't make any sense to them because they thought in terms of the world, you know. Nobody wants to be crucified. Eh, crucifixion, that eh, must be symbolic. It's not symbolic. The caption for this story I'm going to take to not today from another work by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. A bad choice, by the way, for high school students. It's not quintessentially Dickensian. It has no lightheartedness about it, very little, uh, not those bumptious and crazy madcap characters that you find both good and evil in his other works. If you want to turn kids off to Dickens, make them read A Tale of Two Cities when they're 15, 16 years old. But if you do, I doubt that you can understand the book unless you understand the controlling image of the book, the controlling plot, which can be given by the cryptic message received from France by the good banker at the beginning of the book, the message is recalled to life. Now, if, you know, secular teachers say, well, why is it recalled to life, teach? Well, well, because, you know, he's in prison for a long time, and that's like being dead, and now he's out of prison, so he's recalled to life. Oh, okay. What does it have to do with the rest of the book? It doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the book. Uh, no, it has everything to do with the rest of the book, because the whole book is about the resurrection from the dead. That's what the book is about. Uh, has anybody here seen the um, very fine, I think it was Frank Capra, the director, I think, okay? Um, directed the great old British actor Ronald Coleman as Sidney Carton in A Tale of Two Cities. And Capra, I think, understood what that book was about. He understood it was about Easter. So there's a sentence from scripture that Dickens puts in near the end of the novel again and again which Capra couldn't find a way to insert in his movie by giving it as a line to be spoken by somebody because it would have been out of place. It would have been too much. That line, that verse from scripture is from the Gospel of John. And it doesn't have to do with the good French doctor Manette who has spent 18 years in the Bastille and is let free at the beginning of the book. It has to do with the hero of the book who is a prodigal in a way. He's wasted his talents. He drinks. He is in love with that doctor's daughter, Lucy, Lucy Manette. She's not going to marry him. She marries the man who looks very much like him. And that chance physical resemblance allowed that fellow, Charles Darnay, to be acquitted of a capital crime at the, in England at the beginning of the novel. This Sidney Carton knows that he would be a terrible husband for Lucy. He didn't learn self-esteem in school. So he had that advantage. He was not taught to deceive himself. There are many self-deceived characters in Dickens. Sidney Carton is not one of them. He knows that he is a bad man. He also knows that he could have been a good man, but that he has wasted his life. So um, in a extraordinarily moving scene in the middle of the novel. He comes to Lucy, 
and Lucy is in love with the other man, the good man, Charles Darnay. And he says, I love you, I've loved you from the moment I saw you first, but I know that I would only drag you down to my level. I only ask this of you, that you promise me two things. One, that I might come and go as a welcome visitor to your house any day. I will only take advantage of this four times in a year, even if that. And that if it should ever come to pass that I could do anything at all for you or for anyone whom you love, that you will accept the gift from me. And she makes the promise. The book, which is set during the time of the French Revolution, sends her husband now, now a husband of quite some years. Seven or eight years they're married. They have a little girl. They had a little boy who died. Sends him back to France to uh, set a prisoner free who was associated with his uncle's estate, and his uncle was a thoroughly evil man. And his uncle is the villain of the book. And instead of being grateful to him for uh, his support of the poor and um, his gallant return to France to free a good man who has been falsely charged, the people, the mob, in their democratic fury, throw him into prison and charge him with being an aristocrat, which is basically capital crime. And all kinds of means are taken to set him free from that prison, and they seem to succeed, but they fail in the end because of the implacable fury of a woman whose family was destroyed by the evil uncle, the Marquis de saint evremont And when all other means have failed, this Sidney Carton, will take advantage of some chloroform, a turnkey who he has the goods on, and this chance physical resemblance that he bears to Lucy's husband to enter the prison on the night before the execution, have him write down a message which he doesn't understand, Okay, he's just, just do it, do it, do it, do exactly what I tell He writes down a message that's essentially coming from Sidney himself. And while he's finishing the last sentence, uh, Sidney Carton jumps him and presses the chloroform to his face, struggles with him, because then Charles Darnay knows that he gets in a sense of what he's doing, but he passes out. They change clothing. The turnkey, who has been blackmailed into doing this, drags out Sidney but it's really the husband of uh, Miss Manette, the husband of this woman that he has um, loved. The Capra understood it. So in, in a scene in the movie, he has Lucy, and this is not in the book, beg Sidney in one of his visits to come with them to church on Christmas Eve. It is Christmas Eve, it is snowing, and the voices of Christmas carolers are heard in the distance. And with that inimitably sad face that Ronald Coleman could have, very expressive face, he declines. And the camera, black and white movie, so you are not distracted by color. You are looking at faces and hands in a black and white movie. Focuses on the face and the snowflakes falling, falling upon his hat, his hair, his face, his shoulders, as he looks on. Perfect that Capra did that, and perfect what he did towards the end of the novel. When Sidney is forming this plan, if all goes badly, this is the last resort. The verse from scripture is from that great dramatic scene when Jesus is with Mary and Martha. And one sister comes to him and then another. It's heart wringing, this uh, scene. Jesus says to um, Martha, um, will your, you know that your brother will rise again? And she says, I know that he will rise again on the last day in the resurrection. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. 
That's the verse that echoes through the last several chapters of <laughs> Tale of Two Cities. I mean that it's actually there. It's in print. It's in Sidney's mind. And he is, you see, by his love of Lucy and his sacrificial death for a man who is his friend, despite the fact that he's got the woman that she loves. Uh, he's got the woman that he, Sidney, loves. He's going to do this. It's Sidney who is being recalled to life. He's the one whose resurrection from the dead we are beholding in this novel. He is the one who was dead, and yet now he lives. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. Capra couldn't have somebody uttering those words. So in a scene towards the end of the movie, when we see him thinking, forming the plan in his mind, in the little garret where Lucy's and Lucy's protectors have been staying in Paris, there is a mantelpiece above the fireplace behind Ronald Coleman and a plaque on the mantelpiece, which reads, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. And you see that, you see Ronald Coleman, you see his face, and there's that plaque. It's very easy to read, it's right there. Those are the two things you see. You see his face, you see the plaque. I am the resurrection and the life. That's the ultimate story for the human race and for each individual man. I am the resurrection and the life. We find it in the prodigal story of the prodigal son. I shall arise now and go into my father's house. That too is in Dickens' mind. I shall arise and go into my father's house. That's what Sidney Carton has essentially said. It's the story of St. Augustine wrestling, wrestling, wrestling with his physical passions and the faith until finally, finally the grace of God comes to him. Not a self-improvement plan, eight steps. And he hears the voice of a child that says, tole lege, tole lege. Pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. And he goes to the table nearby. He's been weeping and weeping. He goes to the table nearby. There's a collection of the letters of St. Paul. He opens them at random. Uh, not in chambering, not in lusts, not in wickedness, fornication, etc. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. And at that moment, all of his years of wandering, all of his years of disorderly passions fall away from him like scales from the eyes of St. Paul. These are the stories that we have as Christians. But they are not our stories alone. This, these are the stories of the human race. The human race sometimes gets an inkling that these are the stories, even in pagan times. We know that they are the stories. They are the ultimate stories. And they should form all that we do in our encounters with the arts. These are the two great ones. I can only say this with confidence because of Jesus, because of Christ. Otherwise, we might say with St. Paul, we are of all men the most miserable, the most to be pitied. But these stories are not just cunningly devised fables, as St. Peter says. They are more than fairy tales. They are fairy tales in Chesterton's sense of the word, and they are true. They are stories, and they are true. And all the myths of the world, insofar as they possess the truth in some form or other, point to these stories, because they all point towards him through whom all things were made. And if that is a fact, that is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through him all things were made, right? If that is true, then all the human stories in the world, insofar as they make any sense at all, will be leading to the man whom Chesterton called the everlasting man, who is the man Jesus. As St. John says in his letter, that which was from the beginning, He's thinking of his gospel and Genesis, as he was thinking of Genesis when he wrote his gospel, and Psalm 8, 
and the book of Job. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. I pause here for a moment. Christians do not teach a theory of salvation. St. Paul didn't preach a theory of salvation. He preached Christ and him crucified. And it was not a theoretical body that Christ rose in. I've heard recently that uh, you know, children raised in the church are uh, they're 20 years old, 25 years old. They're unclear about this. They actually do not believe in the resurrection of the flesh. Well, what the heck do you believe in? I'm spiritual. Um, anybody tells you, well, I'm just spiritual. Well, Satan is spiritual. Uh, doesn't do him any good. Well, I believe that God exists. Well, so does Satan. Satan believes that God exists. We must believe in Christ. That is to say, entrust ourselves entirely to him. And that's not a theory. Jesus did not say to Thomas, oh, Thomas, take your hand and put it into my theoretical uh, wounds in my hand and put your fingers into the theoretical uh, rift in my side. Here, uh, I'm on a shore here. I'm, I'm, what am I doing? Well, I'm having a theoretical breakfast, broiling over a charcoal fire, a theoretical fish. Have you guys eaten yet, theoretically? <laughs> he didn't say, my flesh is theoretical flesh and my blood is theoretical blood, but uh, my flesh is true meat and my blood true drink. That which we have seen, which we have handled, and maybe he is thinking of that moment with Thomas of the word of life, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and which was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Yeshua Christos, the Lord saves um, Jesus, Christos, the anointed of God, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He's a real man. He's the real man. He's the human being that all of our piecemeal humanities are aiming towards. Every saint is a unique and precious and unrepeatable instantiation of Christ. When you look into the face of a saint, you're looking into the face of Christ and a face that will resemble all the other faces of Christ and will not resemble any one of them at all because they're all so different. It's sin that makes people indistinguishable from one another because when you're covered with mud, it's hard to tell the difference between one person and another. And one person in the grip of bestial physical passion will look not much different from another. But the saints are distinct in glory. It's Christ that gives us the hope that these stories I've been telling are all abundantly, super abundantly true. And I will end with now a poem, okay, which sums up what I've been saying, I think, very well. And I say poem, and half of the people are suddenly find that their necks are itchy, right? And as uh, Bishop Min said, the men suddenly find that they have to use the restroom. A French woman, a philosopher who died as an exiled Jew in England in the 20th century, Simone Weil, who was a Christian, so to speak, in hope, kept this poem on her person at all times. I had it sewn into her garments. It's a poem that's the end of, it's the consummation of, a volume of poetry written by the greatest lyric poet in the history of the English language, George Herbert. I say George Herbert, nobody who's been to a public school has heard the name. And a lot of Christians haven't heard the name. And why the heck haven't they heard the name of the greatest lyric poet in English? And as a subset of that, the greatest poet of religious lyric. This is the consummation of his volume of poetry called The Temple. And The Temple, if you find any episode in the Christian life, the Christian pilgrimage, that is not in the temple, joy, peace, prayer, agony, the feeling of having been abandoned, 
uh, sin. It's, oh, it's all there. It's all there. It's all leading up to this moment. Think of Jesus' parable of the wedding feast and think of the book of Revelation. This is a short poem. This poem was written nearly 400 years ago by an Anglican priest who gave up a promising career at court. He ended up being the pastor of a rural uh, curacy in the east of England. He walked near and far to minister to his parishioners and probably wrecked his health in his duties. He's died at the age of 39. The poem is simply called Love. Love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he, I the unkind, ungrateful. Ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hands and smiling made reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. And so the whole volume ends, and the little concluding note at the bottom of the page reads, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. See, you understood that poem. Okay. Well, artists, readers, teachers, think about these things, and as Jesus says, go thou and do likewise. Thanks. Thanks.